Hello again, everyone. I'm Simon Haynes. Welcome back to the Ramsey Centre and to the third of our distinguished speaker lectures for this year. Now, so far, we've heard about Aphrodite and Xi Jinping, the ancient cultural roots of one civilization and the contemporary political redirection of another one. But today we return to the first theme, really, uh, by hearing about the classics, the great books, and why we need them. Now, as you know, the Ramsey Centre's key remit is to support Australian university courses in the classic texts of both Western and other civilizations. And so we've invited one of Australia's leading public intellectuals to talk to us about the indispensable classic texts. He is Peter Craven, perhaps our most distinguished independent literary critical figure. Educated at the University of Melbourne, Peter was the founding editor in 1981 of Scripsy, perhaps the most celebrated of all Australia's independent literary magazines, indeed widely regarded in its time as one of the best in the world. He was also the founding editor 20 years ago of the influential quarterly essay, which I believe is still running. He writes about every aspect of culture from Shakespeare and the Bible to contemporary television. He's a frequent contributor to both the Murdoch and the Nine Press, including The Age, The Sydney Morning Herald and The Australian. He writes a weekly column for The Spectator and is the former drama critic of The Saturday Paper. So here is Peter Craven to talk to us about the classics and why we must keep them alive. Thank you so much, Simon. Well, why are the classics of our literature, indeed of any art form important? And why should we strive to teach them? Now, the simplest answer to this is to say, in the manner of Henry James, it's because of the depth of life they represent. The moral aspect of literature by which we recognize it as a symbolic form of truth, or in the, in the case of philosophy, an explicit engagement with human understanding via, via the practice of argument, bearing in mind the um, expressive complexity of this in the case of the greatest and most literary of philosophers, Plato, never mind that he, he banished, he banished the poets, that seems to have been a, a competitive embargo. But I'm a babe in the woods in these matters as I am with fine arts and music. Of course, that's no reason for ingratitude when it comes to judgments from authority. If we're told from on high that Wittgenstein is one of the greatest 20th century philosophers, that Piero della Francesca was one of the greatest Renaissance masters, that no articulation of a politically conservative vision equal Hobbes, we'd be foolish not to heed them, just as it would be foolish not to heed everyone who says that Bach, Beethoven and Mozart are the greatest composers. We live in a world pockmarked or bejeweled, depending on which way you look at it, with value judgments and more or less universally accepted valuations, which have, have proved regnant in Western civilization, for want of a better word, allowing for the concomitant sense, which is at least a hundred years old, of the Musée Imaginaire the, um, the Picasso who painted La Demoiselle d'Avignon knew the power of the African masks. When, um, when Eliot wrote The Wasteland, published a hundred years ago this year, he could repeat Shanty from the Upanishads and gloss it as the piece of passive understanding because he was drawing on the tradition of mysticism in Hindu Hinduism and knew of what he spoke. Um, doesn't he also place the, um, the Bhagavad Gita with, with Dante's Divine Comedy among the world's very greatest religious poems? 
Every form of culture we know has been westernized, and that is part of our knowledge of it. That's as true of Mao Zedong's mutations of Marxism as it is of Arthur Whaley's translations from the Chinese and Ezra Pound's adaptations of the Tang poets. At 14, I married my Lord Yu, the young girl says, on what might be Orientalist verbal stilts, though the effect of one linguistic and cultural tradition bleeding into another is extraordinary, as it is when, in comparable vein, still concocting a, a chanoiserie, there's Pound's exile's lament, and there is no end of talking, there is no end of things in the heart, or that beautiful careless epigram and epitaph, Fui loved the high cloud and the hill. Alas, he died of alcohol. An iconoclist and a finder of icons, and the poems from the Chinese he imagined and recapitulated from Fenelosa, a part of that still vast tranquil landscape of the Chinese for us. I also seem to remember reading a Penguin Three Tang um, Dynasty Poets published in the 1970s and translated by Arthur Cooper that um, emulated Pound's own image of China with appropriate learning. But we're surely not wrong to think that the dream of the Red Chamber and the romance of the Three Kingdoms might be classic points of entry for forbidden city, cities we do not know. Now, at some public forum, when someone asked where was the art that should by rights accompany the supposed Chinese Imperium, I mentioned Red Cliff, John Wu's then recent adaptation of Three Kingdoms, with its fierce majesty and its weird ambivalence, so comparable to Eisenstein's implicit apotheosis of Stalin as the newborn Tsar in Ivan the Terrible. Then there's that classic form. No, then there's this classic from, is it actually the 11th century Japan, which R.P. Blackmuir, one of the greatest modern critics, wanted to write about, and Adam Brodes doing so, in the introduction to 11 essays in the European novel. What a confounding and beautiful thing the tale of Genji by the Lady Murasaki seems to be. There was an emperor, he lived it matters not when. Whaley, who translated its exoticisms with a lush musicality and a, an exquisiteness of rhetoric, warns that the opening is more fairy tale like than what follows, and tells us that this is as fraught a society, as narcissistic and sophisticated in its shadings and hair splittings over feeling as Proust, the better part of a millennium later. It's written it's written when we were listening to the Battle of Malden. The tale of Genji at the mirror's glance, unfinished and unfinishable, as Blanchot would say, is one of those eye-openers comparable in the reader's development to the moment when, as an adolescent, say as a mid-teenager, you realise that the Greeks had a modernity, that's how we first perceive it, erringly, comparable to our own. When we read Jocasta say to Oedipus, many a man has dreamt as much in the old E.F. Watling Penguin translation, we get a shock of recognition that is thrilling. And we also experience, more particularly if we have a marked interest in drama, the revelation that a sense of dramatic form unmistakably tragic in intensity and achievement 
can be presented in more or less stark modern English. If we're used to Shakespeare, and we would be if we'd had the usual high school education of the post-war period, the plain modernity of the language would work to highlight the structural brilliance of the dramatic construction. As Auden said, any Shakespeare play could be shorter or longer, but the opposite is true of Sophocles, the greatest of all masters of that sometimes despised entity, the well-made play. Not just in Oedipus Rex, which we've just cited, and which Aristotle took as his template in his poetics, but in all his plays. With some people like Jane Montgomery Griffiths, the classicist turned lady of the theater, something like Watling's translation of Sophocles' Electra led her to learn Greek and subsequently read classics at Cambridge and direct the plays in the original Greek. For others of us, the Greeks from Homer down were mingled, mingled with modern modernities. Not long after I hit on the Iliad, firstly in Evie Rea's very novelistic translation, remember how in, um, in Iris Murdoch's The Black Prince, the main character says, everyone should first read Homer in an unvarnished translation. But not long after that, I encountered Christopher Logue in George Steiner's Penguin Book of Modern Verse Translation, and subsequently hunted out the slender burning brilliance of Logue's Pax and Patroclea paraphrases, which I arguably rank with the greatest of Pound's translations. Logue reanimates by making new Aos Rhododactylus, the rosy finger dawn, by this kind of empathic expansion. Rat, pearl, onion, honey. These colors came before the sun, lifted above the ocean, bringing light alike to mortals and immortals. He has Achilles say, King, I have been a fool. The arid bliss self-righteousness provokes, addled my heart. And when the doomed hero, who's lost his beloved Patroclus, says, Let us fight, now, at once. That great lord of language, Odysseus, says, Wait, sipping the word in like a bolt. Marvellous boy. And nothing in Logue's Homer is more characteristic than the way he steals Wordsworth's description of Chatterton in Resol Resolution and um, Independence and Chatterton, that marvellous boy, but provides for it a richer context coming from the mouth of the honey-tongued trickster paying homage to that eternal warrior, that eternal boy, Achilles. The death of Patroclus, Logue's Book 16 of Iliad, was recorded in the 60s by Alan Doby, the BBC's Prince Andre in the Anthony Hopkins War and Peace, by the poet himself and by Vanessa Redgrave, who, as everyone thought, did it like a goddess. Remember wolves, she said, and a version of Homer's epithets was never more eloquent. None of which is meant to say that Logue had parity with Homer any more than Pope's pretty poem, um, as Bentley called it, had. But uh, Christopher Logue did create an image of him and an acoustic resemblance which was stunning. In the late 60s at, at Scripsy, the literary magazine I edited with Michael Hayward, we got Christopher Logue to read a version of his war music with the actor John Stanton, and the upshot was electrifying. Now, Logue influenced the surface of Robert Fagel's translations of the Iliad and the Odyssey, the latter recorded by Ian McKellen, but um, short of Logue's incandescence, 
the plainer versions may be the best bet. Such was the funeral of Hector, tamer of horses, or that most extraordinary moment when Priam comes to beg the body of his son from Achilles and says, I have done what no man ever did. I have lifted my hand in friendship to the killer of my son. And Achilles says, they say, old man, that you too were happy once. Clearly there's a poetry that inheres in the plain sense of the original, which is reproducible the way we imagine the Hebrew and Greek of the Bible to be reproducible. Clive James somewhere, is it in as the epigraph in the epigraph to unreliable memoirs, cites Samuel Butler's translation of the Iliad, which is about as as stately as a prose crib of an epic poem can be. It doesn't stop the mind from imagining what the Reformation period translators would have made of the task of translating Homer, given the piercing elegiac quality of how are the mighty fallen, or the poignancy of David's lament, oh, Absalom, my son, my son, would God I had died for thee, O oh, Absalom, my son. And yes, together with that, we'd want the young to know as much of the Bible as they could come at. The narrative urgency of Samuel and Kings, the whole book of Genesis, the, um, the deep introspective poetry of the Psalms, the near tragedy of Job, the ironic wisdom of Ecclesiastes and its endless, again, elegiac revelation of vanity of vanities. All is vanity and a striving after wind. And of course, the erotic splendor of the Song of Songs. Laurence Olivier does a greatest hits version of the Old Testament in about 12 hours of audio. And yes, you can listen to the whole of the New Testament read by either James Earl Jones or Gregory Peck, choice of Darth Vader or Atticus Finch. Um, in the age of the podcast, we should invest in the audio book versions of the classics of literature where, where they're going to be of use. And needless to say that that should encompass the Bible. It's a long time since the, the late Susan Sontag said in, in some sorrow, they don't even know the stations of the cross. But some rudimentary grasp of the Judeo-Christian tradition would be handy for someone trying to negotiate the art of the last six or seven hundred years, just as the classical myths collected by Ovid in a work of genius uh, the Metamorphoses, the greatest single influence on Shakespeare, with the possible exception of the historian Plut Plutarch. Um, scholars say that um, in Prospero, ye elves of hills, they can tell where Shakespeare was pinching from Arthur Golding, a translation adored by Pound, and when he was echoing the original Latin. But the Greek myths are handy. It would be nice if the youth of today could quote and translate at least bits of the, um, the ancient famous lines, sunt lacrimae rerum met mentem mortalia tangunt, the tears in things that touch the mortal heart, or let's, or let's say, you know that great warning about the uh, about about the wooden horse that's been re repeated in a thousand contexts. Timeo Danaos et Donna Ferentes. I dread the Greeks, yea, when they offer gifts. Timeo is stronger than fear, and that et is an intensifier. So, yea, 
does the trick. I dread the Greeks, yea, when they offer gifts. Now, Dennis Donahue, the distinguished Irish, Irish critic, once mocked R.P. Blackmuir for his scraps of quotations from languages he could not speak, but it's, um, it's hard to see why. Virgil has the advantage of an all but ideal translator in, in Dryden, and reading through Dryden's Aeneid is worth the candle, even if no one's likely uh, to be intimate with the work. If we're circling the last 700 years, it's good, of course, to remember Dante, the anniversary of whose death um, was last year. Dante belongs with Homer and Shakespeare as one of the very greatest writers who ever lived, and his journey through the realms of the afterlife in his Inferno, his, Par his Purgatorio and Paradiso, first with Virgil as his guide, then his beloved Beatrice, has a staggering clarity. Dante is one of those great poets who writes plainly. He writes like the Shakespeare, remember the moment in, in Othello, of keep up your bright swords for the dew will rust them. Or the Marlowe of the Ovid translation, the air is cold and sleep is sweetest now. So we have Francesca early on in the Inferno describe the moment when Paolo gives himself to her. La bocca mi baciò tutto tramante. He kissed my mouth all trembling. Lasciate ogni speranza voi cantate is the original Italian of abandon hope, all ye who enter here. And there's mercifully the cadence power of the Temple Classics edition, which has the Italian on the other side of the page. Amo che annullo amato ama perdona, which means love which to no lover permits excuse for loving, pardons loving. And then ultimately, blindingly, in the face of the three interlocking lights of the divinity, l'amo che muove il sol e l'altre stelle, the love which moves the sun and the other stars. Now one trusts that no one will cancel Dante because of the torture and the Christianity, but you never know. His countryman, the close contemporary of Shakespeare, Caravaggio, one of the greater painters in the history of the world and a master of, of chiaroscuro and stage lighting, is in the process of being cancelled because he, he supposedly killed someone. How this can possibly have pertinence to his painting with its sometimes extraordinary use of street boys and the tumult and drama of everyday life, one cannot begin to imagine. And Caravaggio leads, naturally enough, out of some affinity of the spirit to Shakespeare, even if he's closest in spirit to a play like, like Measure for Measure, admired by Empson and Levis with its fascination for moral paradox as Angelo lusts for Isabella because of her purity. The play contains that oracular speech of the Duke, be absolute for death, which includes that almost Zen-like annihilation of selfhood. Thou art not thyself, for thou exists on many a grain of sand that issue unto dust. But there's also Claudio's, I but to die and go we know not where, which has an extraordinary vigour in its, in its talk of hugging darkness like a bride. And then there's Isabella's man, proud man, dressed in a little brief authority. Me uh, measure for Measure is not as well plotted as The Merchant of Venice, which I think is a disguised problem play, 
but it is at least as rich. The merchant can appall Jewish people, though it contains the impassioned anguish of hath not a Jew eyes and that very beautiful line of Shylock's it was my turquoise, I had it of Leah when I was a bachelor, which has a depth and a poignancy that you would hope would stop the cancellers in their tracks. The way in which anti-Semitism is made to seem normative in this play is devastating, even as it is disturbing. The technique um, Jonathan Miller used for the Olivier Merchant with Jessica listening to the music of the Kaddish in mourning for her father's death at the end of the play seems appropriate. But Shakespeare should be the centre of whatever way we strive to teach whatever civilization we have. Is now a point to mention that the that the history of civilization is at the same time as Walter Benjamin reminded us the history of barbarism. Athens executed Socrates and Rome executed Christ, and both these events should be central to the story we tell. And Renaissance England, Shakespeare's England, was an axe blade world, a world of religious persecution and an exorbitant abuse of power. When we treasure, as we as we should in the lead up to Shakespeare, such lyrics as um, of Wyatt as they flee from me that sometime did me seek and whoso lists to hunt, they're among the greatest poems in the language. We're also aware not only of Wyatt saying, saying of Henry VIII, we shall see the King our master let out at the horse's ass, but also of the dissolution of the, of the monasteries the execution of Thomas More, who wrote Utopia, the fury and bloodshed of establishing a new Gallican form of Christianity in order to consolidate divorce while remaining, as Henry did, a religious conservative. It's a good idea, as we come to Shakespeare, to have an attendant awareness of Machiavelli's The Prince and Montaigne's Essays. Uh, Macbeth is arguably a tragic extrapolation of Machiavelli's sense of the annihilating conundrums of virtue, virtu, as he called it, and Montaigne influences both Hamlet and The Tempest, those twin mirrors of Shakespeare's art. Shakespeare is a world we must preserve and promote. Think of the moment in Henry VI when Gloucester, the future Richard III, gives the speech about the, um, the Camelon, is how Olivier pronounces it, and setting the murderous Machiavel to school. And we realize we're already in the presence of one of the world's great dramatists. Now, there may be some truth in Wilde's wisecrack that nothing of any importance can be taught, but we need to teach or indulge in whatever substitute we can conjure this creation of a world. Think of the glory of early Shakespeare. Romeo and Juliet with its enraptured representation of young love and the light that breaks from that window. Richard II, which Huizinger, the author of The Waning of the Middle Ages, thought was one of the only genuine representations of that stained glass world. Here, cousin, seize the crown, Richard cries to Bolingbroke, of whom he says, good king, great king, and yet not greatly good. Think of what Shakespeare had made of a hobgoblin vice of a king in Richard III and that extraordinary dream sequence, almost like Dante, which Clarence narrates, and for a season after could not but believe I had been in hell. Think too of the sublimity and hilarity of A Midsummer Night's Dream 
an enchanted world, ill met by moonlight, but with Puck setting a girdle round about the earth and all that wonderful comedy when the world of the mechanicals, Bottom and his mates, collides with the fairies and the runaway lovers. These are four Shakespeare plays he could teach at the start of secondary school in year seven. Is that the equivalent of some lunatic wanting to teach set theory to tots? Well, why not? They can learn to sing the most complex music on earth. We should arm ourselves, I think, with stories from Shakespeare. Uh, not Lamb so much as someone like Marchette shoot who follows the stage action and we should anthologize the speeches while also teaching the plays with whatever aids by by way of youtube and film and spoken word recordings we can muster the sooner the young learn the thrill of the rhetoric of henry v we few we happy few we band of brothers and then that contrasting world of Mistress Quickly saying how Falstaff babbled of green fields and cried, God, God. The latter is, the latter is a momentary flashback to the world of Henry IV, where Shakespeare complicates forever his sense of comedy and history by creating his greatest comic character his greatest witty fool, but then giving him a heart that's vulnerable to young Prince Hell. Who but Shakespeare could have counterpointed Falstaff, first with the quicksilver dashing Hotspur who would pluck honour from the pale-faced moon, and then in part two with Justice Shallow, the man with whom so so long ago he had heard the chimes at midnight. This is the zenith of Shakespeare's naturalism. And if we can turn kids on to Hotspur with videos of Sean Connery in the role from the BBC's An Age of Kings in 1960, or slightly later, the Living Shakespeare abridged audio recording to Sir Donald Wolfert's Falstaff, we should. Shakespeare, after all, overlaps with mainstream culture, with the, uh, the traditional heart of popular culture, which is how George Steiner could say he wrote for the Broadway of his day. Remember how Marlon Brando played Mark Antony not long after his Stanley and the Streetcar Named Desire for Joe Mankiewicz, in the MGM film of Julius Caesar with James Mason as Brutus and John Gielgud as Cassius. Brando is utterly fiery, utterly classical. Where does Shakespearean tragedy come from? Did Shakespeare stumble on Hamlet because he'd made Richard II into an actor prince, a drama queen, shattering the mirror of a self he could not stop watching? We have to keep alive the nearly infinite possibilities of how to play and conceive of Hamlet. The extraordinary difficulty of the that tragic villain Macbeth, which um, Denzel Washington attempted recently in a version now steaming, streaming on television. And then there's the gorgeous magniloquence of Othello a role that seems to be written, bizarrely, for a black actor, for the Paul Robeson, James Earl Jones sort of bottomlessly deep voice. And then the, there's the impossible realisation of King Lear. It would be good if young people who, who can cotton on to the overwhelming poignancy of Lear's how could experience it in Peter Brook's film with Paul Schofield and also with Schofield's twin audio recordings. You can see in Lear the impulse towards a purgatorial logic, 
and the possibility of a happy ending that beguiled the 18th century. There's the, um, there's the Wheel of Fire speech, and then there's Lear's We'll Sing Like Birds in the Cage. All of this is a world away um, from what he achieved in Antony and Cleopatra. Is there a greater moment in the whole of drama than the one in which Cleopatra says of the asp, dost thou not see my baby at my breast that sucks the nurse asleep? But King Lear is transitional to the world of the romances, the mouldy tales, as Ben Johnson called them enviously. There's the same preoccupation with fathers and daughters, Leontes and Perdita, Prospero and Miranda, Cles and Marina. Pericles is a staggering work because Shakespeare didn't even bother to rewrite the original piece of romance journey work so that it exhibits his Michelangelo presented those figures half emerging from the stone. Another comparison from the world of the other arts is when um, is when Frank Commode compares Coriolanus with its concentrated structure and architectonics to the late string quartets of Beethoven. Certainly it's, it's nothing like anything else in Shakespeare except perhaps for Time of Athens. But the romances also Shakespeare show Shakespeare at his most obsessional and his most experimental. Think of that moment when Pericles says, meeting Marina, I am wild in my beholding and declares my wife was like this maid. The language of Pericles is almost Baroque. You can see it as halfway to Milton, but it clearly represents a supreme master late in his career doing as he will. A terrible childbed hast thou had, my dear, no light, no fire. The unfriendly elements forgot thee utterly, nor have I time to give thee hallowed to thy grave. Of course we need Paradise Lost, just as we need that utterly opposite writer Chaucer. <clears throat> There's that extraordinary chastity and systematic understatement in Chaucer. Your Ian Twa will slay me suddenly. Your iron too, your two eyes will slay me suddenly. He may the beauty of him not sustain. I may the beauty of them not sustain. Or the end of, of Troilus and Crusade. Go little min bulk, go little min tragedia. Go little my book, go little my tragedy. Of course we need a place for Shakespeare's great contemporary Cervantes and it's instructive to read him in the first English translation done by the Irishman Thomas Shelton, revised, I think, um, in about 1619. Um, Don Quixote is great in any translation, but Shelton's prose comes from the moment before <coughs> that moment when prose flattened itself for one kind of communicability. And the British discovered when they put it on stage with Paul Schofield as the Knight of the Sorrowful Countenance, the tilter at windmills, that Shelton's version sounded like blank verse, the commingling of potential tragedy with wild humour is very parallel to Shakespeare just as the great Spanish plays, Lope de Vega's Fuente of Ahuna and Calderon's Life is a Dream, counterpoint Shakespeare just as Euripides and Aeschylus do. 
Of course, Shakespeare illuminates everything in his vicinity. You can see why Hugh Kenner would say that Dunn must have been a bit like Hamlet. This tallies with the very, uh, very histrionic dash of his extraordinarily great poetry. For God's sake, hold your tongue and let me love. It is the year's midnight and it is the days. Ben Jonson, and as ever, is the great contrast with both of them. And the greatest of Shakespeare's contemporaries and successors take fire from him. Webster's The Duchess of Malfi and um, Middleton's The Changeling are both very great masterpieces. But now seems a moment for a list, the mundane reality behind every grandeur of canon making. So if I were doing one, I'd put in the, the obvious things, Homer, Sappho, pre preferably translated by, by Guy Davenport or Anne Carson, the Greek playwrights, Virgil, Dante, Chaucer, Shakespeare, Don Quixote, Boswell's Life of Johnson, um, Goethe's Faust, um, Louis McNeese's translation is very fine. Um, is Keats the greatest of, of the romantics? There's Byron's Don Juan, um, Jane Austen's novels. In France, there's Baudelaire and um, Stendhal's The Red and the Black. Um, Madame Bovary is an utterly crucial work. The novels of um, the four great novels of, of, of Dostoevsky and then a, as a precursor notes from the underground. Um, the greatest, the greatest of Tolstoy, um, including the death of Ivan Illich, Chekhov's plays, um, Huck Finn, that extraordinary poet Jared Manley Hopkins, then the 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 great towers of um, of modernism, the Joyce of the Joyce of Ulysses, Proust, uh, Rilke's Duino elegies, um, the greatest of Thomas Mann, Musil's The Man Without Qualities. Should we leave it there? The reasons for cancelling Huckleberry, Huckleberry Finn are inane. Huck's All Right, I'll Go to Hell is a supreme act of moral courage. Lionel Trilling's account um, of Jim's pride in human affection is, I think, the um, the definitive liberal response. Heart of Darkness, for heaven's sake, it's a parable of colonialism, not a justification. Kipling's Kim is a hymn to the different faces of Indian religion and civilization. My own practical business is in evaluating new books. David Foster Wallace's Infinite Jest and Don DeLillo's Underworld are among the masterpieces that have come my, my way. One yawning gap with the world of academic, sometime literature, literature departments is the way they've dropped the ball in relation to contemporary literature. T.S. Eliot was not wrong to say that literature was a timeless order modified by every subsequent work of literature, much as this bit of philosophical idealism may be a hard saying. It should be apparent that great works have been produced, that the universities have done little to assimilate. William Gaddis's The Recognitions and J.R. Money in a Voice that Rustled are in this category. And so are the long poems of David Jones in parenthesis and the Anathemata, uh, much admired by Auden. In Australia, a previous generation of academic critics did everything in their power to establish the greatness of Patrick White's work which is um, on par not with Proust and Joyce, but with Faulkner and Nabokov and Beckett. And the same is true of Christina Stead in The Man Who Loved Children. 
although similar efforts have gone into highlight, highlighting Les Murray's poetic genius, the light is flickering. Yes, Gerald Menane is seen as a great writer with those infinite modulations of colour and tone like a Rothko painting, but how long, how long will this perception last? It's not hard to wonder about Roberto Bolaño or Alfreda Jelinek in the piano, teacher Thomas Bernhardt in everything. We need constantly to be aware that literature can be a difficult pleasure, something that was not forgotten in the wake of modernism. We need to be our own library of Alexandria and resist the flames flickering all around us. Wow, Peter, this was a, a I don't know whether to say a tour de force or a tour d'horizon, not quite sure which. <laughs> Wittgenstein, Mao, Pound, The Tale of Genji, to Homer, Dante, Shakespeare, Clive James, Marlon Brando, uh, Denzel Washington, your rather daunting final list, David Jones, William Gaddis, Les Murray. I suspect, um, Peter, that our listeners may want to play this again and again. So look, we really only just have a few minutes now for me to ask you if we could um, perhaps to just develop a couple of the things that you were saying in that fascinating talk. And I think, I think if I've got this right, a point you were making early on was that linguistic and cultural traditions, I think you said bleed into each other, right? So, mm. so Mao, you've got Mao assimilating Marx, just as Pound assimilates the Tang poets in the other direction. So it's beyond silly to draw hard boundaries around cultures and civilizations as if they were kind of, you know, monuments fixed. And it's so Absolutely. valuable to make comparisons, to make comparisons, right? I mean, students in the courses that we sponsor read the Quran alongside the Old Testament or Confucius alongside Aristotle. But you mentioned fascinatingly Genji, the diary of Lady Murasaki, being written at the same time as the Battle of Malden, the great Anglo-Saxon warrior poem, late 10th, early 11th century. I suppose part of what you're saying, it is possible to read classic texts so that you learn a great deal about their eras and cultures as well as about our own, their points of entry, you said, not everything is lost in translation. But, but what I want to say, what I want to ask you is, Malden was written in an early version of English, right? It's, Malden is in Essex. Does that make a difference to us as English speaking re readers from Anglo-Saxon backgrounds? Uh, isn't there a difference for both Europeans and Japanese between reading a Malden or a Genji? So yes, the importance of points of entry, but we will always be more inside our own culture than another one. Isn't one just more formative for its own culture than, than the other? It's complex. It's complex, Simon, isn't it? Like, um, yes, I mean, the Battle of Malden is ours. Um, mm. The Tale of Genji has been um, appropriated for us by Whaley, um, where in some ways, um, closer to the frenzied er erotic um, introspection of the Tale of Genji than we are to the Battle of Malden. You know, we're, we're, we're not, um, we're not martial Anglo-Saxons. Um, but there's always going to be this um, six of one and half a dozen of the other. I, I think of, I think of the Battle of Malden as our culture in a way that, in, in a narrow way that, um, that, um, Genji is not. Um, there's the argument which which Levis was very, or the prejudice perhaps, which Levis was very swayed by, and and at times he came very close to um, uh, the lunacy of Heidegger. You know, Heidegger sort of saying um, um, being can only be um, can only be spoken in German, of which Frank Commode said. Well, that's Heidegger being silly, but um, um, Levis, Levis believed in the um, the absolute power of um, of English, with which we 
had um, a peculiar intimacy, though it's in it's interesting that Lieber's um, departed from his own practice to write about Anna Karenina. And he wrote about Anna Karenina and, you know, in the more translation and said how yes. very good it was. But, but I mean, um, uh, yeah. sorry, no. No, 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 that fascinating. I look at Anna Karenina just made me sort of think about what we're what we're facing across the world at the moment. And 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 going back to Malden, I mean, I can't resist this. Forgive me. Um, Hige shall be hedra, herte kenra, mod shall le mare de urmira lit lath. You know, the resolve shall be firmer, the heart shall be keener, the spirit shall be stronger as our might grows less. It's yeah, almost it's, a it's, it's fabulous. Yeah. It's fabulous yeah. stuff and it connects at, at, atavistically with who we are. Like it it connects with um the pride, if you like, as Australians that we um that we we feel when we read um when we read Churchill's speeches, which are elaborately modelled on Henry V, it connects with with what we think of, um, for what it's worth, as the Anzac spirit or whatever. Um, it connects with the idea of um, honourable soldiership, which is, of course, in different forms in every in every culture. I mean the um, the Japanese have their um, at once baleful and weird and wonderful version of it. But in some ways, the most remarkable thing is the, the hurdles um, we can jump. Um, I mean, I, 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 I don't spend my life reading Mishima, but I know um, people much more intelligent than me who do, and you say to them, but look, I mean, he was a maniac. He was a pervert. Um, he was a fascist. How is he a great novel novelist? And they look at you uh, like the fool you're being and say, um, that's the mystery of how great art works. <laughs> I mean, it, it, um, um, nobody wants Caravaggio to have murdered someone, not I think that there's any firm evidence, but um, as if it has anything to do with anything, you know. I mean, yeah, it, it, this is time. yeah, this is this is very interesting, Peter. And it was in the background of a lot of um, a lot of the things that you were that you were saying about what young people need to know, uh, and yet at the same time, the contemporary climate that seems to discourage them from knowing these things. I mean, um, you, 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 you said young people should be used to Shakespeare. The sooner they learn the thrill of his rhetoric, the better. They should know as much of the Bible as they can come at. It would be nice if they could quote Sunt Lacrima Rerum and Timeo Danaos. But, but, you know, isn't that battle a bit like Malden, you know, already lost? Um, young people are looking at screens and not books. Uh, they're being told, I'm quoting from a recent younger person on, on a, one of our national broadcasters leading conversational sh conversation shows, Shakespeare is the pin-up boy for Western supremacism. I mean, are, are the flames not just flickering all around us, as you said at the end, but are they actually consuming our libraries? Um, what do you think? They're doing their best, but I think... <laughs> um... I, th I think young people encouraged to have their wits about them will be able mm. to see through this. I mean, look at the look at the lunacy that's um, um, overtaken poor old um, Joanne Rowling. Now that mm. woman, that woman is credited, I suppose, rightly um, with with um, getting millions of millennials to read. Mm. She's not a literary novelist. She's a popular novelist, but um, she's a woman of um, of considerable um, integrity. She's a woman of the left. She gives away as much of her money as you can if you're as rich as the Queen of England, 
and the the um, the um, the doubts she expressed, very tentative doubts about um, the efficacy of a premature transgender thing, position that she shares with the highest court in 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 Britain. You know, she was execrated for, and it, it's it's just there is a there is a lunacy in the social media we all benefit from um yeah. and you know it's 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 terrifying but you just have to have faith that um that people will see through it like in anyone any as a clear thinking exercise i anyone who looked at the jk rowling thing i as a punishment for my sins had to rapidly read her new detective story and um she had not done what she was accused of doing. What she was accused of doing would have been defensible, which was to um, have a wicked trans character. She had no such thing. She had a straight hetero sicko who dressed um, as a woman in, in order to rape women. There was no, it, it was unbelievable that the millions of kids who were denouncing the woman who'd led them to read um didn't know the basic facts you know yeah yes it's well i mean and i'm thinking in some ways this this what you've called crazy process began a little while ago i mean you spoke of the insane reasons for cancelling huckleberry finn for example who, who, by the way, as I recall at the end, says he can't stand civilization, spelt with an S at the beginning, you know, Huck, Huck, Huck doesn't want to be civilized by Aunt Sally. But, but, but he, nevertheless, his friendship with Jim, Sorry. his friendship with Jim is one of the most moving pieces of self-discovery and discovery of the other in all of literature. And, you know, you, you rightly say that Conrad's Heart of Darkness doesn't justify colonialism, it kind of parodies it. And, Kipling in Kim and elsewhere is entranced by Indian civilization, not condescending or triumphalist about it. About it. So, you know, there's a kind of dark, not a debate, a shouting match really about texts which must no longer be read. So you think this will blow over? Is it another eruption of the kind of 1960s stick it to the man sort of sort of attitude? Are there deeper cultural currents at work here? Do you think, Peter? What what might they be? Um, I think it it, it it it's an ignorant um, a fusion of um, idiot opinion, misinformed opinion. I don't think I think the kids who are indulging in it literally don't know what they're talking about and i think i think all one can hope hope pray but i suppose trust is that they'll wake up you know yeah, yeah i mean um, yeah one one does hope this i mean a, a further question along these lines is connected with what you were saying about universities which i mean i completely agree they're no longer trying to assimilate and offer uh, great works of modernity to to students or even asking students to think about how one might arrive at a judgment about what constitutes a classic about you know greatness do you, do you think do you think that they're afraid the students will refuse to have greatness thrust upon them uh, is it that is it that university teachers are not prepared to consider the value judgments that calling a work a classic might involve why do they shy away from the very concept of a classic not, not just a modern one but a an older one and they seem to want a theme or an angle uh, on on books rather than just opening oneself to the freshness of the original do you do you agree yeah. i i do agree and i think it's partly i mean in practice historically historically um it was a reaction the like relative I mean, I suppose relativism um, came out of a misapprehension of Northrop Fry. You know, Northrop Fry wanted to um, to um, bypass Leverside style evalu evaluation, uh, like a, a Calvinistic canon, to 
um, the truly great books among the supposedly great, pretty good books. Um, um, English department people um, became irritated um, by the um, by the quest for greatness. Um, mm. I think Chris Walton Crabbe's got a line somewhere um, in his verse. Even a, even the critic doesn't want to play second fiddle all the time, you know. <laughs> Whereas it's critics' business to play to play, yeah. um, to play yeah. second fiddle, Absolutely and it, in right. some ways. It's not and um, yeah, think of think of the old days when everyone would sort of want to prescribe books which were a hundred pages long, not not five hundred pages long. You know, I I think that, it, that what it all comes comes down to, Simon, is a bit like um, Orwell in nineteen eighty four saying, "The only hope is with the proles." You know. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah, the the common yeah. readers to use that leverside term will say, "What's the fuss about this Proust character? Why mm -hmm. why do people carry on about um about Anna Karenina? You know that 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 knowledge is still floating around, and um, I mean I'm I'm hopeful." I'm hopeful that the universities will get back to actually teaching the history of their subject. I mean, um, because of the efforts of of of, of, um, of such things as the Ramsey Centre, um, like I mean, people are not completely stupid. There are all sorts of young um, doctors and lawyers and and um, baristas and bricklayers who who are interested in the best that's been thought and said look i i i look i think that's right and that's the experience that we're having and i think our partner universities are having i must say i find it very encouraging to hear you to hear you saying that and peter i mean i'm i'm conscious unfortunately at the time but i did want to ask you something sort of higher level bigger picture question about something that you said which really did strike me at, at the level at the civilizational level if you like you made a very very good very salutary point i think that the history of civilization is also at the same time a history of barbarism so we celebrate socrates and we celebrate jesus but athens killed one and rome killed the other one and, you know, and I, I can't, I mean, I think that's a, a brilliant point. And I can't help thinking of, that you'll know these lines by Yeats. Um, Civilization is hooped together, brought under a rule, under the semblance of peace by manifold illusion. But man's mm. life is thought. And he, despite his terror, cannot cease ravening through century after century, ravening, raging and uprooting that he may come into the desolation of reality, Egypt and Greece, goodbye, goodbye, Rome. You know, wow. Yeats wrote that yeah. in in the run up to Hitler. You know, in the mid in the yeah. mid thirties. Yeah. Is is the history of civilizations? Is it one of a saving illusion, concealing the eternalness of human savagery? Is reality fundamentally so desolate? Or is the fact that we revere Jesus and Socrates and we despise their murderers a sign that we're not irredeemable? You know, comment? It, it, <laughs> it must, it must, one trusts, um, be a sign that we're, we're, we're not um, mm. irredeemable. Mm. I mean, think of, um, th think of the great books we cherish. I mean, mm. um, I mean, there's no greater representation of um, of Nietzscheanism gone mad than Crime and Punishment. But um, there's the moment when um, when Raskolnikov says to um, to Sonia, "I killed myself, not the old woman." I remember, man, we we um, we published once or twice in Scripsy the um, the Oxford Hegelian um, 
John Jones, who wrote a very distinguished um, book about um, about Aristotle's poetics, but he uh, he he said of um, I killed myself, not the old woman. God knows how the dull words work, but they do. And I mean, there, there's that kind of mystery at the um, at the heart of at the heart of everything. And I mean, I suppose it's something that the um, the world's great religions have always tried to um, to to comprehend. But um, they also have a um, they have a coherent view of it. Yeah. Um, and I mean, when you think of the confusions of um, the ghastly um, lead up to the Second World War, um, um, the political positions taken by by Eliot, by Yeats himself. What you want is the art. It, it, it's the it's the art, not the the blind um, staggering towards rough beasts or whatever. Well, thank you so much, Peter Craven, for giving us such a breathtaking glimpse of or insight into the classics of literature from many cultures. We have indeed been privileged to have you as our guest on the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Simon. Uh, it's it's wonderful to be able to um, to talk about these these matters to someone. And to all our listeners and viewers, thank you for joining us again. We will be back soon, hopefully with a recorded live talk. And also, don't forget our upcoming podcast series on great books of the West, also starting again soon. And also some parallel podcasts for younger people in their later years at secondary school. This is Simon Haynes at the Ramsey Centre saying goodbye for now.